What if a designer promised you an aircraft that had a longer range and faster speed than any other in your arsenal? One that the enemy could neither catch nor reach. A design that could be quickly converted into a bomber, a fighter, or a reconnaissance plane by simply switching out parts. You'd probably be very skeptical, wouldn't you? Well, let me introduce you to the de Havilland Mosquito. This is a World War II in real time special episode on the Mosquito. I'm Indy Nidell. To make this video, we partnered with the game War Thunder, which you can download for free with the link in the description. More on that later. Growing concerns about Germany's rapid rearmament in the late 1930s made military thinkers in Great Britain prepare for possible war. To improve the arsenal of the Royal Air Force, the Directorate of Technical Development put out a call for a new twin-engine medium bomber with the longest range and highest speed possible. Several projects came into being because of this actually, like the Avro Manchester and the Handley Page Halifax but none was really revolutionary. They all favored an all-metal construction with heavy defensive armaments. Geoffrey de Havilland of the de Havilland Aircraft Company was not impressed. Unlike the others, de Havilland did not agree that wood was an outdated construction material. In fact, wooden constructions have a number of advantages, especially for aircraft. The strength to weight ratio is still great. The technology is already there and wood is cheaper and more widely available than metal, especially during wartime. One major advantage is that the stiffness of a thick, stressed skin wooden fuselage without things like support beams not only reduces weight, but also allows more room for additional bombs, fuel tanks, or electronic equipment. Rising to the challenge to create something special, de Havilland and his engineers begin to build a new generation of bomber. The DH-98 Mosquito is made with a balsa and plywood mix. A monocoque construction method allows for an equal distribution of the weight, quite similar to an eggshell. The double-layered stressed skin is made out of thin birch ply, laminated spruce, and cemented balsa strips. Its two spar wings are made in one piece and covered with doped fabric. The plywood is then made waterproof by coating the top skin with casein glue. So despite the press sneeringly calling it a wooden wonder or a wooden tea box, it more closely resembles a composite structure with metal elements. De Havilland's main focus in the design, though, is on its two Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. Before the war, the Merlin III achieved world speed records, and de Havilland correctly foresaw the potential that upgraded Merlins could offer in the future, and he designs his aircraft around them. The first tests are promising, the radiators being inboard of the engines and next to the fuselage giving a perfect wing root stall. But by just following the requirements of the air ministry, de Havilland fears that they won't produce a really exceptional airplane. The required defensive equipment, for example, is such a drag on performance that it threatens to ruin the whole design. De Havilland suggests a radically different approach. Why not get rid of all that defensive equipment altogether? Defensive machine guns can't defend against anti-aircraft fire anyhow, and a slower bomber would need escort fighters. A much better defense, in de Havilland's mind, is speed, with which the bomber can simply outrun the interceptors and present a much harder target to the ground fire. If they get rid of the guns, the gunner, and the ammunition, they could save as much as one-sixth of the weight. From an industrial standpoint, an unarmed bomber would also be much cheaper, require less time to build, and need a smaller crew. But the Air Ministry is not thrilled with the idea of an unarmed wooden bomber. And it is a long, grueling fight to get the Mosquito off the drawing board and into production. Yet de Havilland ultimately prevails, and the first 50 prototypes are ready in late 1941 and early 1942. Thing is, these are not just 50 prototypes of the same design. No, no, no. De Havilland has envisioned that different types of wings, noses, and fuselages can be added to the basic airframe and make conversion easy. So he presents the Air Ministry with four different models of the Mosquito. A reconnaissance plane, a bomber, a bomber fighter, and a fighter. Britain early in the war does not really have an effective reconnaissance aircraft. But knowledge is power, so the Royal Air Force must use its valuable Spitfires to gather intelligence with high-altitude photography. 
However, their range is quite limited, and they need a lot of refueling. The Mosquito PR Mark I provides a good alternative. Powered by two Merlin 21s and outfitted with additional fuel tanks, the Mosquito can possibly even fly all the way across Europe to the Soviet border. Not only that, but the benefit of a navigator and the additional room for radio equipment could lead to much more accurate intelligence. Integrated into the photographic reconnaissance unit, the unarmed Mosquito is outfitted with two 36-inch F-52 cameras and sent to observe the French coastline. The photos that come back, taken from an altitude of more than 24,000 feet, are so accurate that the British can read the individual markings of German aircraft on the ground. Of course, the reconnaissance Mosquitoes are spotted along the way by German BF-109s and FW-190s. Yet the Merlin engines can be pushed to 3,000 RPM, which leads to an airspeed of around 400 miles per hour. They can't maintain this speed for very long, but it is long enough to outrun the fighters. And in case they get hit by shells or shrapnel, the wooden structure proves robust enough that it can actually shrug off a fair amount of damage. And should a Mosquito lack spare parts, repairs can be made by any skilled woodworker. Even the local coffin maker can fix damage from flak and machine guns. Upgraded versions, outfitted with 50-gallon drop tanks and powered by Merlin 61 engines, are almost immune to interception because their speed allows them to climb to 38,000 feet. Throughout 1943, the Mosquitoes provide the Allies with full photographic coverage of northern France, the German Ruhr, North Africa, and the South Pacific. The main fighter in the British arsenal is the Spitfire, whose maneuverability and agility the fighter variant of the Mosquito cannot match. But the Mosquito's longer range and additional electronic equipment gives it an important role as both convoy escort fighter and home defense night fighter. With the guidance of an airborne radar target system and a pack of four 303 machine guns and four Hispano cannons, the Mosquito is great for intercepting enemy nighttime raiders over the British Isles. RAF officer John Cunningham reports, It was in April 1943 that Focke-Wulf 190s were first used at night, mainly to attack London. To our great joy and satisfaction, we found that using max continuous power from the Merlin throughout the whole climb, from takeoff to interception, and with skillful use of the radar, it was just possible to intercept and close in, identify, and then shoot down a focke Wolf 190 carrying a bomb. It was quite remarkable how the Merlin stood up to such harsh treatment. In mid-1942, the Mosquitoes join in on intruder missions into northern France. The Mosquitoes' job is to tie down enemy night fighters over their airfields while other bombers attack the targets. These intruder missions prove so successful that the Mosquito is tried for day fighter conversion. By the end of 1942, they replaced the outdated Bristol Bow Fighters in attacking enemy fighters over the channel. An independent tactical forces formed, called the Rangers, outfitted with 20 millimeter cannons, these mosquito groups make freelance deep penetration raids into specific areas. The Ranger and Intruder missions become the main focus for offensive mosquito fighter action the rest of the war. From Malta, they fly missions into Sicily and North Africa, strafing German columns on the ground. In Italy, they patrol over airfields with such a stranglehold that the Axis can barely move their aircraft during the night. The success of the Mosquitoes makes them more and more the go-to solution for any kind of problem. By October 1943, de Havilland presents the hybrid of fighter and bomber, the FB-6. It is able to carry four 500-pound bombs, but can also be outfitted with an array of machine guns without sacrificing too much speed. This versatility means it can also be more easily upgraded to meet special requirements, like the version of the big gun Mosquito. Envisioned as another plane for home defense, this Mosquito is outfitted with a six-pounder Mullins cannon. Weighing 1,800 pounds, the gun has an automatic feeding mechanism for 66 rounds of heavy shells. Codenamed Tsitsi, these aircraft are to attack enemy submarines in the Bay of Biscay and beyond. Okay, the Mosquito is fairly versatile, but this heavy gun does cause the need for redesign, particularly with additional armor to the cockpit to protect itself from the gun's heavy blow through. Nevertheless, the Tsitsi becomes a fearsome U-boat killer whose heavy gun can penetrate submarines with ease. Now, the first unarmed bomber variants are already being tested as early as December 1941. 
But the interception rate of the German planes is very high at the time. Although the Mosquitoes are usually able to escape their hunters, the British Air Ministry begins once more questioning de Havilland's approach. They want at least a scare gun at the rear. Yet he remains adamant. He will instead continue his search for the greatest performance possible. The overall performance of the Fast Mosquitoes makes them top candidates for special operations as well. On September 25, 1942, 105th Squadron is tasked with bombing the Gestapo headquarters in Norway. Four Mosquito B-4s are loaded with 2,000 pound bombs each. Although the main target is not destroyed and one of the Mosquitoes is lost, they show that the concept of lightning fast bombing attacks is indeed possible. On January 30th, 1943, they repeat that feat, this time raiding Berlin to spoil Adolf Hitler's 10th anniversary and power speech. The Germans are confident that the Allies would not dare to try to attack Berlin during the daytime. They have not reckoned with the Mosquitoes, though. At 11 a.m., the raiders hit the German broadcasting station with perfect timing, just as the radio announcer goes on air. And the Germans have a busy time muffling all the hysterical cries with loud music. As more Mosquitoes become available, they are further organized. The Pathfinder Force puts the best bomber crews into one independent outfit and upgrades them with the new Oboe target system. Others are organized into Siren Tours, in which they bomb several targets in one mission. The name is chosen for the many German air raid sirens they trigger along the way. Advances in design come with every upgrade of the Merlin engines, too. By 1943, the Mosquitoes are ready to carry the 4,000-pound bomb called Blockbuster. De Havilland arranges a new loading design, where the huge bomb is slung in via a hook into extended bomb doors. The Merlin 72 engines are able to cope with the swollen belly of the plane, but the Mosquito is pretty much at its weight limit at that point. Smaller upgrades like, like an improved pressure cabin keep the plane stable, but much more can't really be done. Still, the new Mark 16 is able to carry a 4,000 pound bomb load to an altitude of 35,000 feet and reach Berlin without much opposition. In the end, Jeffrey de Havilland's gamble to push the concept of an unarmed wooden bomber pays off. The Mosquito has the performance to outrun pursuers and enemy anti-aircraft installations and can reach targets far beyond the range of other bombers. The DH-98 is indeed a wooden wonder. It is a superb fighting machine whose expertly designed composite structure makes it not only extremely tough, but also adaptable to a wide range of tasks. In this, the Mosquito is Britain's first truly successful World War II multi-role aircraft. If you would like to put yourselves in the shoes of the Mosquito pilots, then click the link in the description to download War Thunder for free. It's got detailed models of just about every Second World War tank, plane, and ship that you can think of, plus later vehicles like helicopters. And even individual parts of the vehicles can be destroyed, like a tank's cannon, a track, or, or a vehicle's engine, making for a pretty immersive experience. You can also go in and customize vehicles so they're exactly the model you're looking for. You can get the game on PC, Xbox, Xbox Series, PlayStation, including PlayStation 5, the whole nine yards. New players get some unique vehicles and three days of premium account status, and those who already have an account still get some unique vehicles. War Thunder, super fun. See you next time.